insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is Episode 3, Battleground Iran. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. How are you doing today, Sam? Doing good. How about you? I'm doing all right. So this is kind of a, a topical issue, uh, considering everything that's going on here. Uh, but I think my hope here is that we're going to sort of kick off a new theme, thematic format um, our last, our last podcast was a little bit more lighthearted and a little more, uh, less world impacting. I think we could say, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's hard to dodge these issues. Uh, this is all over the news lately. And, uh, I think this is this, when these sort of things crop up, I think we kind of have to take a look at these. Absolutely. So, um, this is, like I said, this is the first in this series that we're going to be doing at. So what we're going to do in this series, in this particular episode, is we're going to take a look at the history of the U.S.-Iran relations, which date back, you know, to, all the way to back to 1914, where uh, the instability in the region really started. Um, although, I mean, it's an area that's been in conflict for thousands of years now, so it's kind of a hotbed for a long time now. Uh, then we'll talk, take a look at the current relationship between the U.S. and Iran, which is an evolving thing. As I was putting the notes together for the show, uh, every day I had to go back and add what the latest thing was uh, uh, for the for the news on it. And then what we're going to do is take a look at the future and where we think it's going to go, um, and and really what we think the, the far reaching impact is going to be. And that's, that's really what the focus of the show is. So, uh, questions, comments before we get started. No, let's just get into it. All right, let's go. So really U S involvement in, uh, Iran's, uh, government can be traced back to 1914. So, you know, Great Britain had uh, obtained a majority stake in, in the state-run oil company that was there um, around about World War I. Uh, after the uh, Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which is what it was called, uh, retained exclusive rights to all Iranian oil fields, uh, around 1935 was is really where a lot of our drama seems to start. So after World War II, things were kind of left in limbo in the Middle East. Things countries were broken up, new countries were being formed, um, and Britain in particular encountered some political issues with their oil rights in Iran, and they turned to the United States to try to settle the matter. Here enters the United States. Um, so under the Truman administration, the United States was originally opposed to British policies in the in the region there. So the United States was not exactly an impartial player when it came to mediating the uh, the issues. And then because of our involvement that we were brought in with the British, uh, we start playing kingmaker in the region here. And that's something that the United States is infamous for, starting with the Eisenhower administration and all through the 20th century to this day. So in 52, um, 
with the change of administrations, America's position on the Iran and British, uh, British affair shifts a bit there. So British intelligence officials kind of nudge us in the direction of, hey, you know what, maybe that prime minister that's in there now, maybe he's not good for, for our interests, so let's, let's kick him out of there. Uh, so Churchill ultimately convinces Eisenhower that uh, Prime Minister, and I'm going to murder these names, Mosaday, I'll say, was leaning towards adopting communism and convinces the United States to run an operation to basically oust him from power. So in 53, the United States puts together um, their operation. They work with the British. And uh, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles directs the CIA to draft plans to overthrow the Iranian government. And we have the CIA's Operation Ajax, which uses various methods to convince Iran's monarch to dismiss the prime minister. So step one in United States relations in Iran. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's a hell of a first step. I mean, to... <laughs> I guess it could be written off as kind of like a proxy war kind of thing, but to have direct involvement like that, removing a, a, a prime minister, not even the United States wasn't even acting alone. It was a, co um, a cooperative effort from two major powers to, yeah. to dethrone this prime minister over resources too. I mean, like they say it's for communism so they can get away with it. Exactly. But it's ultimately over resources. I mean, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> yeah. And this is back in 53, so I, I can imagine things are probably only going to get worse. Yeah, so obviously, you know, you have to imagine this leaves a bad taste in the mouth of Iranians that you have a foreign power influencing your government and the choice of your people and who's going to be in the government. Not to mention this is right after the world powers carved up this entire area and these people that live there got no say in any of that. Exactly, exactly. So you now have, you know, United States in here dictating who's going to be in your government. Sounds a little, you know, kind of neat to draw a parallel between that and the 2016 election where you've got an outside power affecting the United States, which the United States took exception to. But we have a proven history of almost 60 years of doing it around the world in Central America and the Middle East and so forth. Um so as a result, you start to build this resentment towards the United States with the people in the region. That, you know, explodes in 79. So in 79, you have a revolution in Iran where the U.S. backed Shah, um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name at this point, uh, is forced to leave the country. So the Islamic fundamentalists take over the country under Ayatollah Khomeini, who returns from exile and basically proclaims a Islamic Republic of Iran. And the United States Embassy in this whole process is seized by protesters and you have uh, prisoners that are taken hostage from the embassy. Now that action alone is wholly attributed to influencing the 1980 election in the United States where Carter was unable to get any of the hostages freed and Reagan ultimately winds up running a backroom deal to get the hostages free, but have the Iranians wait until he it's on his watch and he gets to take credit for it. So now you're looking at us having overthrown a government, that government itself being overthrown and taking hostages, those hostages now influencing elections in our country now. So it's just, muddled mess it really is not to mention the u.s president or president to be using our own <clears throat> citizens as pawns exactly to, you know gain power and influence and all that exactly it's 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 alarming how uh how mired we get in this then it gets even worse so then in 85 as part of that hostage release we get the iran contra scandal so the U.S. is secretly shipping weapons to Iran in exchange for Tehran's help freeing the U.S. hostages that are held in Lebanon by terrorists that Tehran is associated with. In 88, it gets even worse. The USS Vincennes shoots down an Iranian airplane, which again echoes what's recently happened in the escalation of conflicts now where the Iranians have shot down a Ukrainian aircraft in the midst of this escalation 
We killed 290 people, mostly Iranian pilgrims, on their way to Mecca. Um, again, it's a plane full of martyrs. <laughs> yeah, and it like 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 it's bad enough to escalate the tensions and to kill people, but now you're killing people that are on a holy pilgrimage mm-hmm. at this point, which just makes it even worse. Yeah, like there's nobody more pure than people that are just seeking, you know, <laughs> exactly a pilgrimage. So then. We fast forward a few years here. Resentment's building up. Then we top it off in the United States in 2002 after the 9-11 attacks and we start our war on terror here. And President George W. Bush denounces Iran as part of the axis of evil, which I'm sure must have really helped our prestige in the Middle East there. Actually, I want to double back to the um, USS Vincent shooting down that plane because I had never heard of that. Um, I was I had a question for you. How was that taken at the time? Had like how did they did they spin it to make it a positive thing? It's kind of hard to do that. You can't really make that a positive. Yeah. <laughs> what it was was the plane itself had strayed too close to the Vincennes airspace in the Gulf, and they weren't they weren't listening to hails. And if I remember correctly, it was because. The Vincennes was trying to raise them on a frequency that they weren't using, and it was one that commonly wasn't used by them. So there was a this complete miscommunication, and the commander on the Vincennes assumed that they were under imminent attack and fired. Okay. Um, but you, the other thing that you have to keep in mind is in the 80s is where we get all the terrorism. You get the hijackings from the 70s and the 80s. You get... Uh, uh, passenger liners. So there's this total escalation, especially in that region, because you've got countries like uh, Libya and Gaddafi that are sponsoring, openly sponsoring terrorism. Um, they, they sponsored the Lockerbie plane downing, the discotheque attack in Germany. So the 1980s was very volatile when it came to these random attacks. So everybody really was on edge. And okay. when you had a military force there, everyone was trigger happy. And that makes more sense. Because just reading the facts, it just sounds like we just blew up a plane like for no reason. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. having the contest, it doesn't make it any more you know, morally right, but it, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> you know, it, this isn't the first time in history that a passenger, and it's not the only time in history, a passenger line has been shot down by military. The Russians had a similar situation at, on the... Uh, Peninsula of uh, Kamchuka in the 80s or 90s, I think it was, where they had shot down, I think it was a Japanese airliner. And it was a navigational error where they flew too close to uh, Soviet airspace, where that one was at least a perceived threat where it was your homeland you're defending there, where, you know, it's kind of hard to say the Vincennes is out there in international waters, mind you, but certainly not defending our territory. Right. So... It just looked bad. Yeah. So then, uh, then uh, Bush comes out, calls them the axis of evil, uh, and reveals that Iran's developing nuclear facilities, including uranium enrichment. And this is like everyone kind of suspected that. You kind of knew Iran was going towards nuclear. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind at this point in time in the early 2000s, the only country that has nuclear weapons in the area is. Israel. Now, they don't openly acknowledge it. Even to this day, they don't openly acknowledge that they have nuclear weapons. Um, but given the volatility in that area, it would it's kind of terrifying to think that somebody else could just nuke an entire country off the face of the earth. Um, and given the history of the various Arab-Israeli wars that we've seen so far, that's probably not too far from reality. So we move forward to 2013. Um, President Obama uh, places um, uh, had, uh, has a, a phone call with the Iranian president, uh, which is really the first top level conversation. So we're we're starting to see an ease of relations with Iran at this point in time under the Obama administration, which ultimately you know yields in 2015 the Iran nuclear deal, which. Yeah, call it what it is, it came under a lot of criticism. A lot of people said it's, you know, all it's doing is slowing down Iranian pursuit of a nuclear bomb. They're going to get it no matter what, and this is just going to sort of regulate it. Um, 
but it was it was really the first groundwork that was laid to try to ease these tensions of over 60 years at this point. And then in 2018, um, President Trump decides that he's going to abandon the nuclear deal because he doesn't agree with it. Um, and he reinstates sanctions on the country. So all the goodwill that was put in for six or seven years under the Obama administration is now thrown out the window, basically. And we're back to a near state of war with Iran. Um, this is when retaliation and, and tensions rapidly escalate. The U.S. deploys a carrier strike group to the area. Uh, we have B-52 bombers that are now stationed in the Gulf. A lot of saber rattling on the part of the United States trying to show you know, the kind of power that we can wield there. So in 2019, Iran does what it thinks it can do, and it covertly attacks several oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman to sort of extra, you know, rattle their own sword. Um, they shoot down a U.S. drone over the Strait of Hormuz, which, you know, you're not killing any lives there, but, you know, these drones are a couple million dollar drones, so there's some money involved. Um they claim that the drone itself was in their airspace. The United States, States claims it was in international water. Um, ironically, Iran was able to recover the drone from their land and produce evidence of it. So maybe it was shot down over international waters and fell on their land. I'm <laughs> not really sure, but okay. Uh, and then what else do we have? Um then the Shiite militia group, backed by Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, stages attacks on U.S. bases near Kirkuk, uh, killing a civilian contractor. When we say civilian contractor, they're almost always security contractors in this case when they're this close to a frontline post. It's not an electrician that's out there changing light bulbs. Um, then the United States, because, you know, an eye for an eye conducts airstrikes on five facilities in Iraq and Syria controlled by Hez uh, a, a offshoot of Hezbollah, uh, which is they think was responsible for the missile strikes, so traced back to Iran. Uh, then pro-Iranian protesters uh, demonstrating against American airstrikes attacked the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Um, then Iran's top general... Uh, Kasim Soleimani, which is what's been in the news lately, is killed by a U.S. airstrike in Iraq. And that sort of forces all hell to break loose at that point. So now the United States is actively assassinating members of the Iranian military. Not only that, they're doing it on foreign soil. Yeah, wasn't the justification for this that he had ties to... Uh, the group, the, the IRC, I think. The, yes, as we mentioned earlier, which I, doesn't justify it, but no, he was definitely <clears throat> traced back to being involved. He was basically the guy that headed up their their terrorist uh, organization ties. Yeah, it still looks really bad though, because like, imagine if a U.S. general got blown up in like Michigan. Exactly. You know, like exactly. It, it's insane. Um, so. So okay, let me let me just continue down yeah. our path of eye for an eye, and then by the end of the story, everybody's blind. So we assassinate General Soleimani, then Iran fires ballistic missiles at two U.S. bases in Iraq, which and here's where the propaganda comes in, where the United States claims, oh well, they just landed in the middle of nowhere, and nobody was hurt, uh, nobody was killed. Well, that's great. So it was really just them trying to save face. Well, it turns out you read recent news accounts and there were casualties. There weren't any deaths, but there were casualties. Um, I did watch a video, and I, unfortunately I didn't queue it up. I should have. Uh, and it was a video that showed the United States uh, air defense phalanx systems, the automated Gatling guns that you see on U.S. ships. Apparently they had them in place at the air bases, and when the missiles were detected, these things spring into action. And it's impressive. That's pretty cool. To see these things. <laughs> and they're shooting missiles down left and right and everything. That's kind of terrifying, but also kind of cool. It is. It is. Um, 
So I could tur- I could certainly see why, because like the Iranians kind of knew the U.S. air defenses. Everyone thinks when you think missile defense, they think Patriot missiles. Well, it, it turns out the Patriot missiles were great propaganda weapons during the Gulf War, but that was almost 30 years ago now, and they were about 30% accurate then. So they're a great propaganda piece, but they're really only one part of the overall air defense. And Iran, what the United States is saying is Iran knew that we had this good missile defense system. So they were just firing these things blind, just, you know, in fury so they could keep their people happy. So ironically, around the same time frame that this ballistic missile attack happens, a Ukrainian passenger jet, um, is shot down in Iraq as well, leaving Baghdad. And at first, no one claimed responsibility for it. You had um, uh, the airline itself basically claimed that it was a mechanical problem. And later it turns out that it was shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile. Um, What was interesting here is once that information came out, and Iran was aware of it, they basically blamed U.S. adventurism. So they basically said, all right, look, if the U.S. hadn't escalated things, we would have never attacked and we would have never shot this plane down. Which sounds like, you know, sound logic, right? Um, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau seemed to think it was sound logic because apparently there was a number of Canadians that were on that plane that were killed. And he, once all the facts come out, he makes a statement basically saying, you know, we need to de-escalate, you know, partially blaming the United States for the downing of the airliner. Uh, that's a sticky situation. (laughs) It is. Because, I mean, I mean, he is right, but I, I don't think Iran should just get away with blowing up a plane full of people. I mean, just like we shouldn't back when we did it apparently in the 80s or 90s. I agree. Um... But I think it's a lot easier to frame Iran as the type of country that would shoot down a plane full of people. It, for you know the U.S. propaganda, it's going to be harder to spin it. I don't know because Trudeau does have a point, especially if his citizens were killed. What's he supposed to do? He can't say, "Well, you know, I just keep doing what you're doing." His people are dying. He has he has constituents he has to answer to, and the U.S. It is obviously part of you know it's it's on the U.S. just as much as it is. On Iran, Absolutely. more so on the on the U.S., I think. But I don't know with this situation, it, it's difficult if a nation shoots down a plane full of innocent people that it could be another nation's fault that it happened. You know? Yeah. Well, and the the interesting thing is, you look at all of this right now. This recent history that we're talking about here is all happening over a country that's neither of the two combatants' country. So Iraq is stuck in the middle here. United States and Iran are waging a proxy war in Iraq and not for like territorial sovereignty or resources or anything. Just a pissing contest. Just a pissing contest. (laughs) That's it. So that's where we are from a historical standpoint. There were a few other things that have happened, but it was mostly political rhetoric back and forth. There weren't any key events that have happened since then. So let's come back and we'll talk about where we are relationship-wise between the U.S. and Iran. So let's talk just a little bit about uh, General Soleimani. Okay, so he was the head of Iran's elite Quds force. He was the architect of Iran's proxy wars in the Middle East. Um, The U.S. killed him. And this is the reason the White House initially gave, because he was actively developing plans to attack American diplomats and service members in Iraq and throughout the region. Now, the interesting thing about this is, after that statement came out by the Trump administration, uh, there was a top-secret briefing that happened where justification was given to certain members of Congress. And there were two Republican congressmen who came out, and I didn't write their names down, I guess I probably should have, um, who basically said that was the most useless briefing we've ever been at. They've they've offered absolutely no justification for why we would have 
basically committed an act of war on another country's territory. Yeah, th I'm not up on my foreign policy. I'm obviously not an expert on these things, but I don't understand how we're not at war at the moment. Because, I mean, this seems like an act of war. Like, I don't understand how we haven't, they haven't declared on us or we haven't declared on them. Is it, is it a... Well, uh, and, and that's a very interesting point. And this is why Congress had demanded that briefing, because only Congress can declare war. Mm. The president does not have the right, based on the Constitution, to declare war. But he can sign off on drone strikes that blow up a bunch of people. That's, yeah. I mean, some of those executive orders are, are questionable. Mm. But if the United States is going to actively go to war, the president has to go to Congress and ask Congress to go to war. And this is a, one of the reasons why there's a lot of people, both Democrat and Republican, who are kind of annoyed at the fact that, that Trump is authorizing these types of airstrikes on foreign soil against foreign nationals who aren't members of the country that you're actually attacking. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, the U.S. also accused... Um, Soleimani of approving attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad earlier in the week. And uh, the Iran's Ayatollah Khamenei uh, called Soleimani the international face of resistance. So now Iran is trying to hold this guy up as the ultimate champion of the underdog for every other country. A martyr, which is always what happens when exactly. this kind of stuff happens. But not even just a martyr for Iran. He's, he's basically saying, okay, this was the man that everybody should look up to if you're being beaten down by the uh, United States. Like a superhero. Yeah. Yeah. So so he's trying to rally other countries to his cause now. Uh, and he, you know, declared three days of public mourning for Soleimani as well. Um, so obviously tensions are inflamed at this point in time. Um, Iran's president, Rouhani, responded to the attack through his advisors saying uh, Trump, through his gamble, has dragged the U.S. into the most dangerous situation in the region. Whoever put his foot beyond the red line should be ready to face its consequences. Now, okay, I can't really expect him to say anything other than, you know, a little bit of military bluster there. Clearly, if the United States went to war with Iran, the United States would win. The problem you run into here is that if the United States goes to war in that region, we knew it back in the 90s when we had to, you know, confront Saddam Hussein when he went in uh, to Kuwait the first time, that the only way to be successful in that region is through a coalition. The United States is never going to be able to get involved in that region and not have to fight every Arab nation there if they're going up against another Arab nation. The problem you have here is the Trump administration has systematically pissed off every Arab nation in the region. So <laughs> there's not very much chance of forming a coalition at this point in time should the tensions rise to that point, which means the United States won't have any bases in the area, which was key to the first and second Persian Gulf Wars that the United States was involved in because everything was based out of Saudi Arabia. Well, Saudi Arabia is going to probably get a little bit too much pressure from the Arab world to allow that to continue to happen, especially when we're dropping missile strikes on countries that we're not, you know, openly in conflict with. And killing civilians. And killing... Of, of those countries. Which, yeah. You know, just like with Trudeau, the leaders of those countries have people they have to answer to when their citizens are dead because Absolutely. of us. Absolutely, Yeah. Um, so at this point in time, you know, we talk about Trump's authority and Trump can't declare war. So at this point in time, by all accounts, it's unclear what legal authority the U S relied on to carry out the attack, um, other than Trump's word, which we're all meant to believe, which is terrifying by the way, the fact that Trump, I mean, not to get political, but just as a human being, the fact that he can just say it and a missile comes out of the sky and kills a bunch of people. It's yeah. scary. <laughs> it, it is frightening. Um, you know, American presidents claim broad authority to act without the approval of Congress when U.S. personnel and interests are facing imminent threat. 
But the Pentagon did not provide evidence to back up the assertion that Soleimani was planning new attacks against Americans. Now, a lot of times this has happened in the past where the Pentagon won't provide that information because it could compromise an intelligence source. Um, but really, I, he's, I think Trump's having significant issues trying to justify this, especially given his history over the last three and a half years or so of every time, you know, he does something that's controversial, he does something else to sort of distract from it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the elephant in the room, right? I mean, we have the impeachment and there's, I don't know if you've seen it online, it's been all over the place, but the tweet of his back from like 2013, um, calling out President Obama, saying that President Obama is going to start a war in Iran in order to get reelected. Yes. And yes. It's, it's impossible to ignore that. I mean, it, it seems like that's what it is. I mean, that's, that's the most obvious candidate for and, why this is all happening. And coincidentally, it's an election year, and all of a sudden we're dropping misses on Iranian generals. So um, I don't want to get too political here, but let's read between the lines. I mean, yeah, it, <clears throat> it's impossible not to. So obviously there's, there's blowback from this. So from a domestic standpoint, um, Democratic Connecticut – uh, Senator from Connecticut, Richard Blumenthal, said that Trump owes a full explanation to Congress and the American people. And I agree. And and I think that crosses party lines. Everyone needs to know, because if this goes down the natural path that you think it would with an all-out war, you're putting American lives at risk. It's one thing to have a drone drop a missile on someone and not have any American lives at risk. But now you've exposed American lives to retaliation, which you knew was going to happen. Um, it did. Fortunately, we didn't have any lives lost. Um, but this is a very early stage here. So if you're going to take the United States down that path, uh, the president needs to provide justification for it. Um the present authorizations for use of military force in no way cover starting a possible new war. This step could bring the most consequential military confrontation in decades, Blumenthal goes on to say. Yeah. And I agree. Hmm. Um, He's probably right. <clears throat> well, I mean, if you're, yeah, it's it's hard to, to think it's the most consequential given the duration we've been in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of what I mean. I mean, this <clears throat> this just seems like another step in the endless Middle Eastern conflict that we've had since the 90s. It does, but the problem that you run into now is you have Iran who has had, they were devastated after the Iran-Iraq war. So they were not a threat to the region. They've had almost 30 years to build up their military. They are actively pursuing nuclear weapons, there are those that suspect they may have several nuclear warheads that perhaps they didn't create, but they may have gotten from elsewhere, such as South Korea. So you have someone who is potentially armed with nuclear weapons who, not to sound insensitive, but they're crazy enough to use them. And then you have other targets in that area besides the United States. For instance, if Israel knew that Iran had nuclear weapons, they'd nuke them in a minute to neutralize them. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> I think, I don't know. I take the stance that it's mutually assured destruction, especially with things like NATO and so many countries still being tied up in alliances. Just, you know, we're repeating that mistake again from history. But I think, I don't think anyone is going to use nukes like that because as soon as one person does it, everyone's going to have to do it to retaliate, and then the world is gone. And I think, I don't know, I, I think there's basic human instinct that prevents it. I think the nukes, whether they exist or not, are just part of the saber-rattling that we've been talking about. I don't think they're ever going to be really deployed. See, and I think when we were talking global superpowers, United States versus Soviet Union, I would agree. Mutual assured, assured destruction meant we could destroy civilization – 10 times over if we, if we went to war. The problem I think we have to with regional conflicts like this is you have fundamentalists who clearly have no problem killing themselves in a righteous attempt to further their cause. So the idea that 
mutually assured destruction is a deterrent is kind of out the window. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, number two, you've got the Israelis who, you know, to coin a phrase from a movie, are pilgrims in an unholy land there. You know, you're surrounded by your enemies on all sides. You've already fought three wars now to preserve yourself. It's self-preservation. Israel's are going to do whatever they have to. I mean, they've already flown airstrikes against nuclear facilities in Iran to disable their ability to produce nuclear weapons. Now you have a international coalition who basically says, okay, well, you can have some aspects of a nuclear weapons program, but we want to make sure that we're inspecting you. And I, I don't necessarily agree with the Obama administration's approach to handling nuclear weapons in Iran, but it is what it is, and we've had it for so many years. And it's better than nothing. That's true. Um, so if they felt threatened, Israel would strike against Iran. Now, Israel probably wouldn't initiate a nuclear strike, but they absolutely would retaliate with one if they were hit with one. And I think it's it's you have to think of the geography of that region too. I mean, everybody's on top of one another, right? And one nuke would probably devastate everybody there. So, I, yeah, even more. I can't. I can't imagine. It's it's you can't even comprehend it. You know. Yeah, and that's why I think that region could certainly explode with nuclear weapons, regardless of your allies and your treaties. I think any nuclear confrontation would be confined to that area. Um, not that that justifies anything, given how much of the economic output from that region the entire world's dependent on. And po world population. <laughs> and the fallout <laughs> that would be, you know, any mm -hmm. atmosphere, you know. I mean, it's either way, it's not good, but you're not going to wipe out the entire planet with that, which is, it, it's almost why I think it's more likely that it would happen in that way, because you're not going to wipe out. There isn't mutually assured destruction of everyone. You know, you've got two fanatical groups that are, that are what they think are vying for their own lives. So it's a powder keg waiting to explode. Not, and it always has been. Not to mention that what months, maybe a little over a year ago, we were just having the same discussion about North Korea. With yeah. Nuclear weapons. So yeah. Everyone seems to be, and and that new North Korea talk just seems to went away now to be replaced with Iran. It just seems like it's we're trading one, uh, you know, tyrannical powder keg for another, and we are also a tyrannical powder keg. I think you know to be completely honest. Well, when you start dropping missiles randomly on people yeah. in other people's countries, it doesn't look good no matter how you cut it. Um. So Senator Chris Murphy. Uh, from Connecticut, a uh, member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, called the targeted killing of Iranian General Soleimani shocking, despite the fact that he unquestionably is responsible for the death of hundreds of Americans. And you also have to take a step back and think, what precedent does this set? So does, is this saying it's okay to assassinate military members now when you're not at war? So if somebody, you know is angry at, you know, our joint head of our joint chief of staff and they happen to be on vacation somewhere. It's okay to kill them. Like, how is that okay? Like there are literally our international laws to prevent you from assassinating heads of state at a state level. Yeah. And, and his weird qualifier of it's shocking, but let's not forget <laughs> he killed. So like, what if he killed tens of Americans? Like, is it not okay to blow him up in his, like his hometown or something? Right. You know? What's like, that threshold? Yeah, like, where do you draw that line? It doesn't, it's, he, it's so weird. The semantics of it. I, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, he goes on to say that the U S should expect that Iran will respond disproportionately, which strangely enough, they didn't do in their first response. Um, they responded by attacking military targets, which they were very explicit about, which I thought was kind of interesting. He also added, it's incumbent upon the administration to come to Congress and explain why they had to take the specific action in order to prevent harm to Americans abroad. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Never. <laughs> Especially it, with impeachment. He's never going to do that. No, no. And it's all going to be mired in smoke and mirrors and and 
point finger pointing mm-hmm. and the and and then it'll be smothered because it'll be sensitive information that's that's vital to national security and that's how they're going to get away with it. So we talked briefly about the effect on foreign affairs, but let's delve a little deeper in the blowback that we're going to get from foreign affairs. So the European Union's already stepped out and talked about this. Uh, former European Union Foreign Affairs Chief uh, Frederica, Frederica Mogherini has called for wisdom and rationality warning against a major scale confrontation in the Middle East. Well, we can rule that out. Yeah, I, I just don't think that the people in charge that you're dealing no, with. No, on I, either side. Yeah, I feel bad. Like when I read statements like this from people – not just from Europe, but like even Trudeau to a certain extent, they all seem so calm and like, you know, level headed. And then yeah. you hear a statement from Trump and he's just like, I'm going to kill everyone. <laughs> Guns are blazing. Yeah. Get them all. Yeah, America. <laughs> it's just like, it's it's just insane. The, the contrast between, you know, leaders. <sighs> Hope that those who still believe in wisdom and rationality will prevail, that some of the diplomatic achievements of the past will be preserved and that a major scale confrontation will be avoided. An extremely dangerous escalation in the Middle East, uh, she says. Um, and the problem that I have is you don't really have a storied history of positive diplomatic relations there. You had a little bit of an outreach by the Obama administration, but that lasted six years, maybe. Um, and that's compared to 60 some years of America basically trying to strong arm its way in that region. And then the Trump administration comes in and starts the same old policy again. So we really don't have a lot of credibility, I don't think, in that region. No, I, th- I think the damage is, is too far. You know, it's, it's already been done. And I think it's, it's to the point where it would take, you know, double the amount of time to repair it that we've yeah. already done. I mean, Dating back, if we date it, we're dating back with Britain to, the, to 1914. It's almost a hundred years of, of systematic manipulation and and oppression to a certain extent. Yeah, I agree. Economically, at least. European Council President Charles Michel called for an end to violent and provocative action in Iraq, warning in a statement against a flare-up of violence in the region. The cycle of violence, provocations, and retaliations, which have witnessed. Uh, in Iraq over the past few weeks has to stop. Okay. Go work. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, The risk is a generalized flare-up of violence in the whole region and the rise of obscure forces of terrorism that thrive at times of religious and national tensions. And I think that's probably the most profound part to take from that statement is that when we run into these situations here, we've seen them time and time again in the past – where the United States has forced an issue, the United States is a superpower. Countries like Iran, Iraq, Syria, they can't compete with the United States on the grand scale of open warfare. So what do they do? They do they resort to terrorist tactics, to guerrilla tactics. Everything that was used against the United States who was still the majority, you know, the major force in Vietnam and kicked us out of Vietnam after huge losses. The United States has proven time and time again that it cannot fight an unconventional war, Um, mainly based on humanitarian principles. You know, if you're not going to play by the rules of the terrorists, then you shouldn't play the terrorist game. And the United States and most of Western Europe refuses to play by those rules because they're brutal. Could you see a, a drone strike assassinating a foreign general as an act of terrorism from the other side? I mean, it is. You're, the intent there was, one, to kill, and two, to terrorize the rest of the staff to change their policies. Yeah, I mean, what's the difference between a drone strike and a car bomb, you know, at that point? You're right. It, a, a couple million dollars, that's about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what we did was nothing more than a terrorist attack. Um Michelle's statement is the first collective response by the European Union following the U.S. drone strike. Uh, it's certainly not going to be the last. China chimed in as well. Uh, United Nations Ambassador for China spoke about the killing of Soleimani. 
in a U.S. strike before a closed-door United Nations Security Council, saying uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Iraq should be fully addressed. Uh, and I think that's, you know, as much as assassinating, open assassination of a foreign military asset outside of war is a whole issue in and of itself, the fact that you're doing it on someone else's soil is a whole nother issue. Yeah, but I also think we should take China's word with a grain of salt, considering they're actively, like, taking pictures of people and, like, making them disappear. I don't think we should take moral foreign advice from um, from China, honestly. Well, yeah, they're def they definitely shouldn't be our moral compass, but... They do have a good point. Based on what you said <laughs> yeah. there, it's pretty bad when China has yeah. room to criticize us, okay? <clears throat> So that, that itself is a problem. Uh, France came out in, at the United Nation uh, and called for de-escalation of the situation, too. Now, France, granted, France is not our biggest fan and hasn't been for years. Um, but ultimately, that leads to uh, you know Justin Trudeau coming out with his statement against the United States. So now you've got the European Union, specifically you know France included in there. You have China. And you have Canada that are kind of pissed off at us at this point. That's not even counting the, the countries in the Middle East. Uh, we'll Those get are to, our allies. We'll get to that in a minute. So the next thing that you have is a troop buildup now. Okay, So the United States will deploy thousands of additional troops to the Middle East as tensions with Iran mount following the airstrike. The additional troops will come from the immediate response force of the 82nd Airborne, these forces forces have been in place on prepare to deploy orders and would be sent to the region if the situation merited it, which at this point, I can almost guarantee it will. Uh, following the disturbance of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, the U.S. deployed 750 troops from the same unit already. The new deployment encompasses the rest of the brigade, typically around 3,000 soldiers. So we're already building up troops over there, which just by doing that, you're inflaming the situation. I'm not saying we probably don't need them in there to protect what interests that we have. But, you know, when you go nose to nose with a bully, that's going to cause tension. When you spit in the bully's face, which is what we're doing now, that's just going to inflame things more. Yeah, it's it's like mobilization from before World War Run 1, right, where you had... Like Russia and, and England and all those countries mobilized in like a day. Yeah. And then the next day, war broke out on multiple fronts across the country. Like when you do things like this, that's not de escalating tension. That's just making it more tense. It's right. adding more gunpowder to the keg. You know, when you have more people at it to a staring contest, you got more people that are going to blink. And it's like, what what are the troops going to do? Like, it, short of an invasion, why are they there? Because we're using, we're clearly using missiles and drones to kill, like to fire at each other. It's not like it's ground warfare. Well, and that's the thing, you know, I could certainly see you bringing in additional troops for security. You're going to secure your embassy. You're going to pull your perimeters back. You're going to minimize the chance of a car bomb getting by. Okay. That's great. But they're lobbing ballistic missiles at you. You're just putting more lives at risk. Right. Are you going to, what are you going to do? Pile the bodies up to make it <laughs> a little harder for them to kill you? He, I can imagine Trump or his advisors or whatever seeing this as a show of force, you know. If we if we show them the might of the American army, then maybe they'll back down. Except that they don't care. Right. Because they don't need an army to match that because they it's just a more it's a bigger target that and, they can just shoot more missiles at. And that's the thing, you're not going to see a Saddam Hussein response where you're going to have a row of tanks stand up yeah. against the United States. You're going to have more, you know, terroristic attacks. And because they work, and they, right. don't, they don't need to do... And putting more troops there is just more targets of opportunity exactly. for the terrorists. Exactly. Um, so, regional stability. So, protests against the current regime in Iran have already begun in the wake of the downing of the passenger plane. Uh, President Trump has offered, and this is like... I just wish he would shut up sometimes. That's all. So, okay, so you had protests that were... that. Before all this happened, the protesters in Iran were protesting the U.S., burning U.S. flags, burning Trump in effigy, and they hated the U.S. So then you have this escalation. You have this accidental shooting down of the Ukrainian plane, 
And now the protesters are protesting their own government in Iran. So what does Trump do? Instead of just sitting back and thinking, okay, job well done, let them do their job, Trump steps out and offers words of support to the supporters in Iran, further raising tensions. So, hey, good job, guys. Yeah, get mad at your people over there because we're the good guys now, right? And, like, it's is it really going to end that way? No. Because they, they, they hate us as much as they hate their own government at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd wager they hate us more because at least their government has a face they can yell at. Right. I mean, their their know, government has the guns that are right there. We're 5,000 so. miles across an ocean pulling the strings for them. They haven't even met us or seen us, you know? Yeah. So the next thing that kind of really was the, the other boot dropping is Iran has requested the departure of all American forces from their country. In the wake of the unauthorized attack, go figure that. The United States attacks our country and kills a foreign dignitary. And what? Iraq was just supposed to accept that and pat you on the back and thank you for it? He wasn't in the country on vacation. He was there for a reason. So now Iraq is now pissed off at the United States and wants us out of the country, which will destabilize the region even more. Qatar's... Amir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, that's a really long name, and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau have held phone conversations during which the two leaders agreed on a need to de escalate. So Justin Trudeau is now building friendships in the Middle East in the wake of this. Is it an election year for Canada? I don't know. Because Trudeau's been getting some bad press. I wouldn't be surprised if. He, uh, he, on could, to, he could certainly be capitalizing on this. Not saying it's a bad thing. You know, it just might serve an ulterior purpose. Right. So to summarize where we are right now, the United States has spent 60 years pissing off the people of the Middle East. Our tensions have risen at this point in time because we're openly assassinating people, uh, generals of Iran in other people's countries. Um, the European Union, China, and pretty much every responsible nation out there is calling us on the carpet for being terrorists, basically. So we'll come back and we'll look at where we think this whole mess is going to go. So I took the liberty of putting together some scenarios where I think this could go. And I want to get your thoughts on it. So the first scenario is the most obvious one, and that's continued escalation. It's very likely under the Trump administration it's going to get worse. Trump's already threatening more sanctions against Iran, uh, and it's a lead up to an election year, and Trump needs a win in foreign policy affairs to solidify his run. Um, What do you think about, do you think that's the most likely scenario, or how do you feel about that? Probably. Unfortunately, um, I don't think it's going to be seen as a foreign policy win, though, even by his supporters. I don't I, I mean, there's a certain amount of delusion that comes with with it, you know, that they just blindly support him from what I've seen anyway. Right. Um, for people that I know that support him and things like that. But I don't see how you could spin this as a positive other than just pure, you know, American military might and, you know, wanting to support that. But. When the entire world, or at least many of the major powers in the world, are saying that this is wrong, it's difficult to be ignorant of that, and it's difficult to ignore that. And I don't, I think at this point, pretty much no matter what he does, except for maybe de escalation, would be seen as a win. I don't even think if he de escalated, it would be seen as a win because I think he's done too much damage already. Yeah. For whoever, if he gets reelected or whoever takes over after him. Well, and it's hard to, to claim a win when you cause the problem yeah. and, and then fix it. That is a Trump, kind of that's a very Trump thing to do, though. It is. It is. So the next scenario I see is, is that we do de-escalate tensions. It's it's unlikely under the current administration, but it is an election year. You know, we're not we're not making this a whole political thing here, but there's a chance that Trump isn't president after the election. Do you think somebody else can come in and do this? I think it's going to be difficult under the current Iranian regime unless that regime changes as well. But do you think of of the Democratic candidates now, do you think if any one of those wins the election, becomes president, that they're going to be able to go in there and fix this? I think it would be a repeat of what we got with Obama, right? I mean, we had George Bush, who escalated things, did ex- not to the extent that Trump is doing, but he ramped up our presence in the region, you know, 
inflame those tensions. Then we had Obama come in and kind of calm things down. I mean, Obama still used drone strikes a lot and killed a lot of people, but for the overall foreign affairs side of it, he did calm things down. Then we got Trump that set it all back again. Right. So I think, I think if we get a Democrat in office, that they're definitely going to try to deescalate. I don't think they're going to, you know, want to go to war. Doesn't seem like their kind of thing. But I, I'm not sure how far deescalation would go without it looking like the United States is just plain rolling over, which I don't think would sit well either. So that's a good point. I agree with you there. So the other scenario that I see, or the other question, I guess, really, that I see from those two scenarios is how does the regional stability play out? So Iran and Iraq are uh, growing openly hostile to the U.S. already. Other Mideast countries are chiming in and showing their discontent towards U.S. policies. And regime, regime change in Iran uh, appears that appears to be influenced by the U.S. could have wide-ranging impacts. So right now, the, the citizens are protesting the government. If there is a forceful change of regime there, it's very likely to be attributed to U.S. interference. How do you think that's going to play out in regional stability in the Arab world? I think it might help unite them, maybe. I mean, if they have a common enemy, which is us, um, it might help. Just like, you know, there, there's, I had a history teacher that, that said there always has to be an other. You know, we had, you know, the Nazis, they were the other. Right. There's always got to be an enemy for someone to get behind. And I think in this case, the United States actions make them the other for the Middle East. And it might it might help them get behind something, maybe put aside their differences, which might be a negative thing in the long run because it would make them a larger threat. But it would also maybe stop the killing and the infighting. I'm really not sure. I think there's so many factors in play that it's it's almost impossible, you know, to to try to call it. Yeah, and sadly, I think you're right. I think we we tend to play that other, the bad guy, and the, especially when it comes to the Middle East, uh, and we've played that role and we've owned it since the Eisenhower administration. And I think it's it, it's been dangerous for the region. So I have to ask the nuclear question. Okay, Iran's already stepping up efforts to develop their nuclear capability. They've already said that in the wake of these attacks. Uh, the U.S. has already pulled out of the Obama nuclear treaty, uh, and a nuclear-armed Iran could seriously destabilize the region. How do you think nukes are going to play into this if Iran gets a nuclear weapon? Well, you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's a pretty likely scenario where it's it's a contained thing just to that area. Yeah, um, I, I think... You know, originally I had the sense that it wouldn't with mutually assured destruction, but but you definitely changed my mind on that with um, fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism, and how that ties into the culture and and the tactics. Um, so I think if if they were to be used, it would be self-contained. Um, I do wonder though if they might try to do some kind of rogue attack in the United States, but I think that would not end well for anyone. Um, and I think that they would be able to see that as well, even if it's not mutually assured destruction. I think that that would I think that's might be even too far, you know, for them. Right. Um, so I think it would be something self-contained just in that area. So the impact on future administrations. So even if Trump is reelected, he's only got another term to go, another four years. So what do you think the negative impact on future administrations for the next four to six years probably would be? If Trump's elected or no? Well, just... That region on oh. whoever, whatever administration we have. Well, I think it it's terrible. I think it's pretty bad. Um, we didn't really have. I mean, even with Obama, we didn't really have anything positive. I mean, we did have positive, but not nearly as much as we should have. Right. And we were just getting a foot in the door, and you know that door was then slammed and torn down and you know blown up ten different ways. So I think no matter who's in power, I think if the situation is going to remain pretty similar for the next four to six years, unless some miracle happens where, you know, people rationality and wisdom end up prevailing, which is highly unlikely. What do you think about um, the United States' ability to, to form an international coalition moving forward now with so many countries against us? Do you think there's any chance of doing that right now or repairing what we have and doing it in the future? I think that's also highly unlikely. I think if anything, it would go the other way. I think that they would form a coalition against us, um, which would be pretty dangerous and i think the u.s is running out of allies to deal with the situation since most countries 
if they realize that there's no power play in it for them, would probably just wipe their hands of it. Um, not to mention China and Russia doing joint military exercises, North Korea being involved with that as well. I mean, you've got a almost a coalition of superpowers as well, maybe pulling strings behind the scenes. So it's, I think it's all bad. <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I and I agree. I think you're right. It's to to say that it's an uphill battle would be an understatement. Uh, and I think what influence we had in the region previously, I think we've kind of spent all that currency at this point in time, and we don't really have much in the way of control there. Uh, that was all I had to talk about. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, uh, just and it's it's. It's pretty simple, but you know when we when we're talking about it, you know, two white guys in suburban New Jersey, you have to remember that the people being affected by this ultimately are the people that live there. And when we're fighting these proxy wars, and when the people in charge thousands of miles away from the civilians in the Middle East, they're the ones that are going to end up getting killed. And as well as U.S. troops as well, they're the ones being sent over there to to fight the dirty work and do the dirty work of the people in power. And I think that a lot of that gets overlooked. And I think that it. it a lot of the focus in, in maybe the media or in just discourse is, you know, oh, I can't believe Trump did this or I can't believe we did, you know, we did that drone strike. But ultimately, there's a human cost to this. And I think that that's something we should, you know, think about. That's a very good point. And it really is. I mean, not only is there an immediate cost, you know, in the lives that are affected by this, but you look, you know, 20, 30 years down the line and the orphans that we're making today are the terrorists that we're going to have to deal with you know, in the future. So very good point there. But I think that was it for today. Um, I think uh, good podcast, rough subject to do it on, but I think it was, you know, had to be done, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can check our podcast out at uh, online on YouTube at www.youtube.com slash insights into things. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. <clears throat> you can get our audio at podcast.insightsintotomorrow.com. You can hit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. Or you can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. And I think we're done for today. Another one in the books. And we're out.